Hello, everybody. This is After the Oligarchy. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Robin Hanel. Robin Hanel is a professor of economics in the United States, co-founder with Michael Albert of the post-capitalist model known as participatory economics and author of many books. Today's conversation is in association with Meta, the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization. This is the second in a series of interviews with Professor Hanel about participatory economics, and in particular, his latest book, Democratic Economic Planning, published in 2021. Robin Hanel, thank you very much for joining me. Great to be with you. So the question is about how to decide who is a worker council member and who isn't. So in Paracon, how does a worker council decide who is a member and who isn't? For consumer councils, the answer is a simple matter of geography. If you live in a certain area, you're part of that consumer council, that's easy. However, for worker council, it's more complicated. Worker council will use many labor inputs, but some of them will be considered internal inputs of labor from the worker council members, and some will be considered external inputs of labor from non-members. How is this distinction made in practice? And how is this distinction made such that wage labor isn't introduced through the back door by excluding certain workers from membership? So, for example, just to illustrate that. So, again, coming back to our furniture factory, let's say you have a handful of cleaners who come in and they clean the offices every day. And so you could imagine that those cleaners would be part of the furniture factory worker council. But you could also imagine that there's almost a subcontracting situation where the worker council hires the cleaners as external labor and then pays them differently. But then again, maybe I'm I'm thinking of this just in terms of a market, but please, Andrew, just, just come in. There are no external workers. I mean, first, let's just deal with the basics. So how do you become a member of a workers' council? You go to their employment, you go to their personnel department, and you apply. Um, So for existing workers' councils, you're free to quit the one you're in and apply to work in any other one. There's a more complicated issue about how do new workers' councils come into being particularly because as soon as we have a workers' council, they get to participate during the annual planning process and they could be allocated, you know, social resources. So there, there's sort of a question of, do you have to establish some sort of credentials and credibility before we have you, you know, participating in the planning process? But you're not, you're not concerned with that. No. I mean, you're concerned with an issue that basically comes down to how integrated is an industry. So you could have a single company that makes its own steel and then makes its own automobiles. On the other hand, you could have two companies, one that makes the steel and sells the steel to the automobile company and the automobile company buys the steel and then goes ahead and makes the automobile out of the steel. Yes, but do you mind if I just make the question a bit more pointed? So I think probably in the context of Paracon, it, it, the question might be a confusion, okay? But I'm thinking about it because this is a concern that I have about market socialism. And for example, let's look at Google under capitalism and then consider it under market socialism, say, and this will explain where I'm coming from. So Google today has wonderful conditions like many such workplaces with highly skilled labor where you can get your food there and relax on bean bags and, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. However, if you clean the offices where the software engineers work, you have no labor rights, you're considered uh, self-employed, you're paid very little, and you're just treated like human waste, essentially. Okay, that's capitalism. Now let's look at market socialism. So I have concerns that even in a market socialist society, that that worker council who operates Google could have an incentive to treat the cleaners in a similar way, that the cleaners would not be part of that workers council. They wouldn't get the profit divided by number of members because there is an incentive to have as few members as possible and it's still a competitive market situation so you can reduce costs by paying these cleaners less and of course there's the whole coordinator class element there where there's an issue of bargaining power and that's why I picked the cleaners because they have less bargaining power so that's in a market economy but is that even a question in Paracon. First of all this is not a this is not an issue that I have thought about so I'm thinking out loud here Sure. Um, You have a place like Google, and one of the things that has to happen at that place is 
offices have to be cleaned and the cafeteria has to be. I can tell you that back 30 years ago, thinking about this, the way I would have thought about it would have been, well, those are some unpleasant tasks and we have to be sure that when we create jobs, we have to be sure that everybody is going to have to do some of those unpleasant tasks along with those more pleasant tasks. So I would have viewed this as an issue of how do you balance jobs for both empowerment and desirability? And if you don't balance them for desirability, how do you compensate that in terms of greater sacrifices and therefore effort ratings? And I, I think those are perfectly good answers. But what you've introduced is a, is a second possibility, which is, well, wait a minute, you've imagined a more integrated production process where a single workers council is both producing software and also cleaning offices. What if we have a whole separate workers council that is cleaning offices? Now, the place that, that, that I've actually done some thinking about this is in the chapter on reproductive labor. Yeah. And there it's not a question of a workplace. It's a question of, are there going to be households that hire, you know, people to, are you going to be able to gardening for you and they're going to be all male? And are you going to be able to hire people to come and make your beds and do your laundry and do a deep cleaning on your house? And those people in that workers council are going to be all female. Um, it was that sort of problem and issue that we were trying to address. But it introduces the same issue, which is, so let's see. So if we have this place that says we don't want to clean our offices at all, we want to hire another workers' council to come and do this. Well, can I, can I say something just which might clarify yeah. things a bit? So one of the really interesting insights from your work is when you talk about one of the important characteristics of a market system being this relation between buyer-seller pairs and how that's something that fundamentally distinguishes participatory economics from a market system is that those relations are, are mediated through much larger groups, through society as a whole, through the planning procedure. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because I think the problem I've raised is definitely an issue in a market socialist system, precisely because you have one entity relating privately to another, where let's say Google can be a buyer of labor of, let's say, some cleaners, whether as individuals or as a cleaning firm, they can relate just completely privately. However, in participatory economics, it's unclear to me that that worker council, let's say Google, has a role in determining how much to pay those cleaners in the first place. Because firstly, the social cost of the labor is going to be calculated through the planning process. Yep. And then the amount that the cleaners are paid is going to be through the effort rating process. And then that's that's more of a general question about the effort ratings. I suppose the question there would be, would there be some abuse of, so that would be if the cleaners were part of the workers' council, you know, would they be undervalued? And then if they were part of their own worker council, which was cleaning and, and they were they were supplying cleaning labor to a separate worker council, it seems that the planning process wouldn't allow that kind of exploitative relationship precisely because it's not that there's one worker council and another and they have this private buying relationship. It's that Google as a worker council would have to go through the entire planning process to interact with this cleaning worker council. Is that accurate? I, I think you're right about that, that if you deal with it internally, it's a question of balancing jobs inside Google. If you deal with it externally, and of course, every workplace deals with some things externally because every workplace buys inputs from other workers' councils. So in a sense, what we have, Google is basically buying a cleaning service input from another workers' council. I think what our, I think what the argument would be is that, that that's for them to decide. And I'm trying to think how capitalist firms decide that. Capitalist firms decide that basically on the basis of profitability. So is it cheaper for us to go ahead and have employees who are cleaners or is it cheaper for us to hire a cleaning service to come in? Workers' councils in a participatory economy are also going to have to make that decision. What do we do internally and what do we buy from others' workers' councils? 
I mean, there's an argument to be made for outsourcing as long as it's not exploitative. It's, it's like you make, this, you make this point in the social reproduction chapter about there being, for example, cleaning or gardening or other caring worker councils is that, that you know, there are economies of scale. It's just that right. in, in capitalism and particularly in the neoliberal period, outsourcing has been used as a method of attack on labor as a way of, of undervaluing it and an ability to not give people rights. I mean, the, the classic example is universities. I mean, I remember at American University, when I started working there in the 70s, the cleaning staff were employees of American University with benefits. Now, they didn't get paid fair. First of all, their, their job complexes weren't fair compared to professors. And second of all, their pay rates weren't fair compared to professors. And, and the pay rates of professors compared to provosts weren't fair either. Um, but, and then one thing that happened during, you know, during the, the 30 years I worked there was AU decided that employing those cleaning people as American University employees and therefore, and they were unionized, and they had AU employee benefit available, and the university decided, well, it would be cheaper for us just to hire a cleaning service. And that's exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. And it's, of course, exactly the kind of thing we don't want to somehow inadvertently allow to happen. Yes. And I'm trying to think through, well, what is the mechanism in a participatory economy that prevents that from happening? And I basically think it's the indicative prices that don't let that happen. I mean, under capitalism, it's about bargaining power as well, again. Because, because those two units are bargaining with one another. Exactly. And, and there's no two units that are bargaining with one another over those prices. I mean, there's a question about monopoly and things like that, but that I want to put that aside because that's a more general discussion. I mean, here, I mean, here's here's the thing. I mean, it, in a participatory economy, ask yourself what's the average effort rating going to be inside the cleaning worker council compared to the Google workers council? And there's three possibilities. One is the average effort rating is going to be the same, in which case there's no exploitation. If anything, the average effort rating in the cleaning council is going to be higher if the disutility of that labor is on average higher than the disutility of the labor in the Google council. If a participatory Google outsourced the cleaning, the average pay of the cleaners would be higher than the average pay of the Google employees, or it would be the same. Let's let's look at the reverse, just just to make this clear, okay? So let's say that the average effort rating for the cleaners was lower for some reason, okay? Just for the sake of illustrating the idea, okay? Um, so you know, let's just put a number on it so people can picture. So let's say that's zero point five, and in Google it's it's one. So that means that the Google workers are making twice as much in their income as the cleaners. Okay, I'm not saying that that necessarily would happen. I'm just saying in this little thought experiment, there would be. So you're saying that because these two entities are separated, that's an opportunity for the Google workers to make more income personally, because if they were joined, it would bring the average effort rating down. Is that what you're saying? I'm, sorry, I'm, tr I'm trying to ask basically, what's this relationship between the effort rating, the average effort rating and exploitation? How do those connect. What I'm saying is that your, hypo your, your hypothetical example can't happen in a participatory economy. You can't have the Google Worker Council. You can't have the worker. The, the Google Worker Council isn't going to have double the effort rating that the, that the cleaning worker council is. Either they're going to have the same average effort rating, or if anything, the cleaning council is going to have a higher effort rating because on average, they're making a greater sacrifice. What is the significance of that? What is this? What is the, this relationship between what the the relative effort ratings are and either having an equitable relationship or an, a relationship of exploitation? Well, I th I think you uh, what happens in capitalism when Google hires a a cleaning service company to come in and clean the Google offices, I think you are correctly characterizing that as a kind of, as a source of exploitation and a kind of exploitation. 
And, and I think what I'm arguing is that fortunately that won't happen in a participatory economy, even if Google decides we're not going to have our own worker council members sharing the work of cleaning offices. We're going to hire a whole office cleaning worker council to come in and do that. Either choice they make, I think we've eliminated the exploitation that that does occur under capitalism for the reasons you and I agree on. We can leave it there. As always, thank you very much for offering me your time. It's been a fascinating discussion and I'm looking forward to pursuing some more of those those questions. Okay. I, I'm I'm really pleased with I mean, I'm hopeful that for the pub for for the viewing public this is useful. And you know, it's also actually personally useful for me. So in that sense, I am always willing to make more time. For both reasons, I'm willing to make more time. It's precisely my intention that there is that dual function of these interviews and in general, the material that I produce on this channel, because one goal certainly is educational. It's to promote these alternative visions and to get people to think about these questions. But it's also to try to actually do some of the work of refining them. Yeah. And if anything, the latter is actually more of my priority. I try to make a balance. So I'm very pleased that you find it useful in that regard. Are you are you are you trying to schedule a session with Anders Sandstrom? It is my intention. I want to finish reading Anarchist Accounting first. But right. yes. Just so you know, I mean, he, he and I have talked about that book from the time he started writing it right through its publication and everything else. And I have admitted to him that one of the things that economists are supposed to be able to, a skill and a tech and a, a skill that economists are supposed to, to, to be able to master is accounting. And I feel like a congenital idiot on the subject of accounting. There is something about accounting that my brain doesn't work that way. And so I have tried to help him while that there's something about the way economists think. I mean, I know when my own students, when in economics, you have to be able to think marginally. And the first thing I have to teach my students is we think marginally. And the students that can't think marginally, they just never get it. And I feel like there's something about accounting where, you know, somehow these things always have to match up no matter what. And that makes no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hopefully you will not, hopefully you'll be a better accounting student than I ever have been. <laughs> um, but, well, Matt, yeah. I, but, but I mean, I can tell you that, Anders has a really good mastery of the economics of participatory economics, and he is the only person amongst us who also has a mastery of accounting. And so I know he's the right person to sort of bring those two pieces of knowledge together to try and sort out, well, how, to, how do you do accounting in a participatory economy? He, he's always asking me questions that arise because he wanted to know how it would work in accounting, and then these aren't questions that I had ever had to answer before, but he has to, he knows they have to be answered from the accountant's point of view. So we've had that kind of relationship over the years now. Well, these are the joys of multidisciplinarity. Uh, yeah. It's yes, like, it it's like um, I showed my, my brother is a lawyer and I showed, uh, he watched some of the videos that I made and he, we were talking about Yanis' uh, Another Now model. And then he was asking me these questions. He's like, you know, there are all these semi-judicial institutions that he's proposing. And he was asking me legal questions about, about these. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, I didn't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really think about that, actually. And it's very possible that Yanis didn't either. Yeah, which, <laughs> which is great. I mean, the thing about accounting is, which I find hilarious, is accounting for me was always the kind of epitome of what I despised, you know, uh, growing up, like and being a teenager. And I remember I remember, I was walking around town once uh, with, a, with a group of friends. And I remember, like, you know, I was going on some rant and I was saying, oh, I'd rather hang myself to be an accountant. And uh, yes. And uh, my friend turns around and goes, my, well, my dad's an accountant. And I just remember just saying, well, I'm not going to lie to you. you know, I'm not going to take it back just because you said that. But now <laughs> I find that after getting into uh, you know political economy, and particularly like I'm a big fan of, of Hyman Minsky, and I know he was a big fan of 
uh, or as you say, you know, disciplining your analysis with balance sheets and all of this. And so now I've gotten to appreciate, actually, this isn't just this completely irrelevant, boring thing. It's actually useful if, if you use it in the right way. I'm a big fan of Minsky also, and I'm and I'm not surprised that he would have been a very good account, been very very good at accounting. That would make sense working on the financial stuff that he worked. That you would have to you you would have had to be good at accounting. Well, I, I my eldest son is a lawyer, but the conversation is very short. The first thing he tells me is, "No, Dad, I'm not going to defend you when you commit crimes," and B, <laughs> Dad. Even if you would pay me, which I know you would not for doing that, I still would not do that. <laughs> so do not come to me with your legal problems. So that's the, that's the extent of the conversation I have with a lawyer in my family. He, he's, he, he just wants to be sure that I know that he will never defend me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you got anything from this video, then please press the like button, consider subscribing, and if you really enjoyed it, then repeat every word at the top of your lungs like they did in Occupy Wall Street. There's a lot more to come. We'll keep exploring better futures for humanity until we get there. And as always, I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. This channel has a wonderful audience and there are usually some very interesting comments under the video, so let's continue that. That's all for now. Our democratic future lies after the oligarchy.